We'll go ahead and take a minute while we wait for attendees to enter the Zoom. Welcome everyone. If you just joined, we're giving it a minute or two to let attendees uh, enter the Zoom. All right, we will go ahead and get things started. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Adrienne Mertens. I am Marin's Water, Marin Waters Communications and Public Affairs Manager. And thank you so much for taking time to join the district tonight for our third community workshop for the Strategic Water Supply Assessment. Um, in addition to these community workshops, our staff and our consultant team from Jacobs Engineering that are here tonight have also been involved in presenting at many board of directors meetings scheduled over the last several months to work through this complex and critical assessment process. Um, but tonight, uh, during this community workshop, you will hear from these folks that are on screen with me who will be catching attendees up on the work done to date. Um, and after the team concludes their informational presentation, which we are going to try to move through quickly so that we can leave time for plenty of questions and comments, um, we will then get into those questions and comments, um, and you'll have the opportunity to ask questions directly of our panelists, uh, provide any comments on information that was covered this evening. And because we want to make sure that uh, we address all your questions, unlike a, a board of directors meetings uh, that are held on Tuesdays, um, this is a community workshop uh, and some more open, um, informal meeting. And so you will be able to ask more than one question. If you think of something later after you've asked a question or left a comment, uh, you can raise your hand again and we'll get back to you. Um, and when we do get to that Q&A portion, uh, to let us know you have a question or comment, uh, you'll use the raise your hand function in Zoom if you're on a computer or your smart device. And if you're dialed into this workshop by phone, you will press star nine. Um, and then finally, just a note that the presentation slides for this meeting tonight are now posted on our website at marinwater.org. Uh, and the video recording of this evening's workshop will be posted on our website tomorrow um, in case you want to go back and view anything again later. Uh, now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Paul Sellier, the district's water resources director, to get us started on the presentation. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Adrian, and uh, welcome folks to our public workshop. It's uh, the third one. Our, our last public workshop, I think, was on June 2nd, um, where we presented information on goals, hydrology, uh, demand, and introduce the concept of, of scenarios. Since then, um, the team's been hard at work and we've run the scenarios and understand that, you know, the, the scenario number three, which we'll see a little bit of tonight, is maybe the worst case scenario. And in that scenario, it does look like we would need additional water supplies to avoid uh, water shortages. Um, since then, we've also laid out a number of water management alternatives, um, and our focus over the coming weeks will be to really firm up the yield and cost of those alternatives um, and just fully, fully define them and understand them. Uh, so tonight, you'll see information, uh, and it is very much in draft form in terms of yield and cost for these alternatives. So as Adrian mentioned tonight, um, we're presenting sort of a summary of information since the last um, uh, public workshop. Um, and our team is here tonight to, mm -hmm. to really, it's our goal to provide you uh, with the facts as, as they are for the strategic water supply assessment and for um, the, the water management alternatives and, and any of the components of, of the assessment. 
And so to the best of our ability this evening, we'd be happy to engage with you and, and respond to your questions. Um, I think right now I'm gonna turn it over to Armin, who's gonna take us through uh, the slides. Okay, thanks, Paul. And um, really looking forward to the discussion this afternoon. Um, I'm Armin Manever from Jacobs Engineering and, and leading the effort from the consulting team side. And today we'll be presenting, uh, doing an overview of the project just to, to give the public uh, an understanding of where we are in the process of, of completing the water supply, uh, strategic water supply assessment. We'll do a brief review of the scenarios and some of the uh, results that we're seeing from those scenarios that Paul just mentioned. And we'll spend the bulk of the time today talking about the water management alternatives that are being evaluated. Um, again, they're all, all on largely in draft form. And I think what we really wanted to do today is kind of show all, all of the work that we're uh, currently doing. Most of it is in draft form and we'll, we'll see some revision over the next uh, four weeks or so. And then we'll talk about the next steps in the schedule and then open it up uh, for, for any questions you might have. Uh, just a quick high level glossary that is um, put together here. This I think probably is most uh, useful if you go back and look at the slides or watch the recording. If, if we talk about some of uh, some of these terms and the acronyms, they're, they're listed here. Uh, we won't go through each of them here today. And we'll try not to use the acronyms as we present, but we always seem to fall into them at some point. So we'll do our best not to. Uh, just an overview of, um, of the project and the purposes of the assessment. Uh, we're really focused on what is the current risk to uh, Marin Waters water delivery reliability under kind of existing or current and uh, future droughts. Um, looking at how much water supply might be needed under future uh, different hydrologic and demand scenarios. And then looking at the range of water supply alternatives that could increase the resiliency of the system, of the district system, and then looking at the strengths and weaknesses of each of those potential options. And then finally, uh, where we'll be heading with the assessment is, is what are the recommendations and how do we begin to take a a portfolio approach towards developing a roadmap towards um, investment in drought resiliency. So we've laid out the, the project in, in various elements, um, largely the first group of, of three elements that are listed on the left here are, is work that we are, are largely um, completed, although still, still some work underway, but by uh, looking at the uh, water supply strategy and goals, developing a decision support model that allows us to evaluate um, evaluate the impacts of various hydrologies or water management op options. Uh, and then looking at water supply and demand scenarios. So all of those things are looking at essentially what are the impacts potentially at the existing system. And from those that, that work, we start to identify um, the resiliency gaps if if you want to describe it that way. And then looking at what types of water supply alternatives could be implemented to help um, reduce that gap or improve the resiliency. So that's the next block here of conducting or developing water supply alternatives um, and then evaluation of those alternatives. And then finally, we move towards developing a, a roadmap and a report. Where we are in the process as of today is essentially the, the development of the water supply alternative. So that the first of the light blue circles on the screen. And I would like to share kind of the process up to this point. But we gotta make sure it's fair. Okay, I, I'll jump into uh, the water supply and demand scenarios. And I think this is really one of the, kind of the foundational elements of of a study such as this, where you're dealing with a large amount of uncertainty, uncertainty in hydrology and growth and in demand. Um, and so we don't really fully understand exactly what future might play out, but we have a, an understanding of the range of, of plausible futures. And so we've taken a, a very careful look at, at a scenario planning approach for this effort, where we are exploring different ranges of, of climate change and variability associated with um, 
with both his history and future climate projections, looking at drought variability, how might demands change and what types of policies and regulations might be um, occurring over that time frame. And our goal through this whole process is to develop a set of scenarios that are illustrative and useful for making decisions in terms of what types of investments might be needed and, and uh, how effective might those investments be under different scenarios. Uh, so for the hydrology, which is one of the major drivers of, of the potential gaps in resiliency, we've been looking at historical droughts, uh, climate projections and paleo reconstructions, as well as developing some stress test hydrologies, which might be uh, the most challenging that we might observe. So we've developed um, five different scenarios um, of different views of the future. So really looking at uh, representing a plausible range of future conditions. And the scenarios vary by, by demand, supply, and hydrology, and then also some uh, other potential changes to the system. What we're looking for in each of these scenarios is, is how does the system respond to those, those um, stress test cases of, of supply and drought, uh, supply and demand, and the system responses. And then what we hope to really look for is our solutions that are robust across all of those scenarios. Certainly there'll be some that are be, be the most challenging, but, but others that are, we wanna make sure be, that we have um, alternatives that can function and provide value across all of those since we're not um, claiming to be having a crystal ball of the future, but having a range of those future conditions. So we have five scenarios. The first one is, is a, uh, current trends, essentially existing, the existing system, existing levels of, of uh, demands and hydrology. We have a, a conservation scenario, which looks at a, um, a higher level of, of uh, reduced per, per capita um, use. We have a short and severe drought, which is looking at kind of a, a, a very acute uh, drought condition that may, have, may uh, exist in the future. And then we've got longer term droughts that are explored in, in our scenario number four. And then finally, our scenario number five is looking at, at a potential for abrupt disruptions on top of those droughts, things like wildfire in the watershed that might reduce the capacity to, to treat water for some period of time. Uh, this table that's shown on the screen here, uh, again, highlights those five scenarios and has the the high level assumptions of what are included from in terms of the hydroclimate conditions, demand assumptions and operational assumptions. Uh, for both scenarios one and two, we're utilizing the historical records of um, the hundred years of record to, to look at, um, at the water supply conditions. Scenario one includes passive level water conservation uh, savings, whereas scenario two has a, a higher level of, of incentivized uh, conservation savings. Uh, both the scenarios one and two include current operations, uh, low, uh, preference for taking local water supply over Sonoma water. Um, it does include supplemental water uh, from Sonoma, uh, taken from Sonoma water with Castagna pump station rehabilitation included. So it's essentially the existing system with different, uh, different variations in demand and historical hydrology. Uh, scenario three, which, which uh, ends up being one of the most challenging scenarios is uh, looking at a severe four-year drought where we've, we've coupled the, the drought conditions of of water year 2020, 2021, with a assuming that 2022 and 2023 would look like 1976 and 1977 hydrology. So we're essentially creating a four-year, a four-year drought that is the most one of the most challenging um, for the potent, for the system. Uh, scenario four looks at um, using different climate projections looks at a long range extended six and seven year droughts. Um, and some of those offer different types of challenges for the system, but they're also um, quite, quite important to look at. And then finally, scenario five 
is uh, similar to, to the scenario three in that it has a four-year drought, but we've also um, envisioned a condition in which you're in a drought and have potential wildfire events in the watershed that might um, trigger operational disruptions. And for this particular scenario, we've made assumptions that we have reduced treatment capacity. Um, we assume that Von Tempe would be offline for six months, uh, Von Tempe treatment plant, and the San Geronimo treatment plant would be at 50% capacity for six months. So we have both supply variations, demand variations, and potential operational disruption variations in, in these scenarios. When we, just as an example, this is uh, this graph here is showing storage, uh, simulated storage conditions for scenario three, that four-year drought. Um, again, using the decision support model, we've been able to both model historical conditions for a validation period, as well as future conditions for the scenarios. Uh, the, the blue banding on the left-hand side essentially shows the historical conditions. The, the blue dots are the actual um, storage conditions up through September 30, 2021. And then the black line represents the model simulated conditions. And once we get into 2022, we've then uh, implemented a 1976 and 1977 hydrology to further stress test the system. And that's where the black line deviates from, from the actual conditions, which actually almost refilled the reservoir storage by the, by the end of, uh, or by the beginning of 2022 in the October and December timeframe. And from these, uh, this is looking at just one individual trace out of, out of hundreds that we look at under each of the scenarios. Um, we have similar traces for scenarios one, two, uh, three, four, and five. And what we look at in those, um, each of these simulations is how much might they fall below certain storage operational limits? And we've assumed roughly 25 to 30,000 acre feet would be the lowest uh, operate, oper, operable storage that we would want to manage um, from. So anything that falls below that, we're describing as a deficit. And then anytime a shortage might have occurred in which there was not sufficient supply to meet the demand, we calculate that as additive to that deficit. And if we look at each of the scenarios uh, using a, one of the higher levels of storage thresholds, and we calculate the maximum deficit from all of those uh, particular realizations, we end up with a, a plot like this, which is starting to show the potential supply deficit for each of the scenarios. Um, scenario, um, scenarios one, two, and three have, have deficits that are nearly above 6,000 acre feet per year. Same with scenario five. And some of the realizations will have, have scenario, um, have lesser amount of, of water supply deficits just because they were not as challenging as others. Um, and each of the realizations will have, more, will have a range of these deficits, but just to put, the, put in context the range of, of potential um, deficits that we're seeing from these scenarios are, are shown here. So for example, um, scenario one and, and one and five are close to 7,000 acre feet. Scenario 4A, which had a, a lesser amount of, of, of deficit condition ended up with, with zero, but we're really looking at what are the most severe conditions. So kind of the higher levels of deficits. So our overall um, findings out of these scenarios were that scenario one has the highest, uh, results in the highest short-term deficit. Um, scenario three uh, has the highest overall um, deficit. Uh, uh, scenario two has, a, has the water conservation savings that reduces the magnitude of that, of the deficit as seen in scenario one. Uh, we, we have uh, additional information that could be shown on scenario four, which is the climate projections where we have, uh, we have extended droughts that, that aren't as severe as, as scenario three in terms of a four-year drought, but are six or seven-year droughts and have a, 
a challenge of a persistent uh, lower level of storage, op uh, operable storage. And then finally, scenario five, which looks at both the hydrologic condition and operational challenge, uh, really challenges us to think about the diversification, um, both in terms of treatability of supply during, during uh, operational disruptions, as well as the availability of supply during, during the drought conditions. And then lastly, we're, we're still doing some refinement on the modeling and the scenarios. So these numbers will, will change somewhat in the future, but the, the general trend is likely to be consistent. And so we've used the scenarios to really describe and, and start to bookend the, the magnitude of the potential problems, uh, resiliency challenges. And then you were really shifting gears and looking at the water management alternatives. So what type of water management alternatives could be considered to, to reduce the risk, improve the reliability and resiliency in the future? And the types of uh, uh, water management alternatives that are can considered, well, the baseline is really the scenarios that we just described, the baseline system, existing operations, um, existing facilities. Uh, we looked at, at desalination or are looking at desalination alternatives, recycled water alternatives, alternatives that look to expand local surface storage, um, increasing the, the use of Sonoma water partnerships and, and different ways in managing the Sonoma water delivery into the marine system, and then water purchases with uh, conveyance through bay inner ties. And then finally, we're looking at, at the, the effects of water conservation on the, on the size and magnitudes of the deficits that we might be envisioning. And with that, I think I will take a pause and have my colleague, Jim Logier, uh, talk through the desalination and the water reuse option. Thank you, Armin. So with respect to desalination, <clears throat> we've developed four options or four under development. I'm gonna talk about the first three that are listed here. Uh, the Petaluma Brackish Re Regional Desalination Option is still under development. So the Marin North Bay Desalination Facility <clears throat> would site a permanent desalination facility at Pelican Way. And that facility would pull in water from the bay with an open intake process it through a microfiltration and pretreatment system, and then the seawater desalination system. Purified water would then be remineralized to make it compatible with the distribution system and match the water quality that exists there. And the brine from that facility would be discharged to the CMSA outfall, blend with the effluent, and be discharged back out to the bay. We developed three different capacities currently. A five MGD facility expandable to 15, a 10 MGD expandable to 15, and then a 15 MGD facility. We're also going forward, going to look at a standalone five MGD facility as well, just to look at the cost associated with that. <clears throat> Our second option, which evolved from the emergency desalination um, study that we did last year in the middle of the drought, would utilize a containerized or leased desalination system. We still have to put in place the infrastructure in order to do that. So we'd have to plan, design, and construct the intake, the brine line, bring power in, and put all that in place. And then at the right time, um, we could then bring in, install a containerized lease system um, to utilize with an infrastructure and provide the desalinated water to the distribution system. So the idea there is basically reduce down how much time it takes to implement this um, once we have the infrastructure in place. That facility would produce about five engines as well, based upon uh, the assumption we made to date. The third option would be essentially a Bay Area regional desalination facility. It would locate a brackish water desalination facility up on the Mallard Slough and one Contra Costa Water District is they have a current intake. Facility would then treat variable brackish salinity water. That water would again be remineralized and put into uh, milk, uh, milk in the aqueduct and wheeled down to Marin through that system through East Bend Live and across the bridge. 
and that system would be sized to produce 20 MGD, but the assumption here is that New England would have access to 5 MGD in that facility. So the cost we developed there would essentially look at splitting the cost up where 25% of the cost of the facility would be borne by New England. The, <coughs> the uh, brine from that facility would be discharged back into this. Next slide. So with respect to considerations around desalination, and obviously these vary a bit depending upon which of those options we talked about. But if we focus on the, the Marin Regional Facility, pulling water out of the bay and discharging back to the bay, obviously first issue we have to consider here is that a ballot measure would have to be uh, approved by the voters to finance and construct a desalination facility. So that's something that has to obviously addressed if we're going to move forward with the desalination facility at Pelican Way. Permitting, obviously, with any desalination facility, particularly one that uses an open intake uh, and discharges to the bay in this case, is quite extensive. And we're, we're thinking that this could take up to as long as seven years to do. There have been facilities in Southern California, such as Carlsbad, that took 15 years to permit. So this is not a minor consideration. And that plays into the timeline. So most likely the timeline for permitting will most likely drive the timeline for implementing the facility since the construction, design and construction of a plant would take less than that amount of time. Once we were to build a, a desalination facility and make a large investment in cost, and given the fact that desal facilities have a high operating cost, we have to look at how that plant would operate. Would that facility be only used during a drought? And basically strand the infrastructure, or would we look at operating it periodically? We're operating it at some reduced capacity all the time. So that becomes a rather critical point in terms of how we implement desalination and how that translates into a dollar per acre foot for costs. Most of us know that seawater desalination or baywater desalination takes a lot of energy to desalinate. That's that high TDS water. So that has to be considered not only in terms of the cost of the energy, but also how that affects the carbon footprint. And then of course the cost, which obviously is critical importance here, uh, like most of these options, but for desal even more so. Next slide. So this table shows the cost that we developed. And this is information that was presented uh, earlier this month. And we are continuing to refine these costs and as I mentioned earlier, in addition to what's shown here on option one, we will include an option for a standalone 500 facility, which would be less than what we show for option 1A. The idea would be we know that desalination costs, like most costs these days, are going to vary because of the nature of what's going on with the marketplace, increases in costs associated with the supply chain, et cetera. So we're going to look at developing a range of costs to cover what we think might be a low end and then what might be a more reasonable high end going forward. Again, these costs will still be class five at the end of the day. So as noticed at the bottom of the, of the slide, there's going to be a range built in, whatever range we come up to as well. And as I mentioned earlier, the paddle room option we're still developing yet, so we haven't developed costs yet for that. But you can see here currently, based upon what we've done today, that our cost numbers are ranging anywhere from a low of $3,100 per acre foot to a high of 57 for option two. Uh, and that's based upon the fact that we wouldn't really consider that a 30 year, um, a 30 year facility, and therefore it's going to have a higher cost in dollar per acre foot. All right, with that, we move on to the next slide. So switching to water reuse, we developed four major options and there's sub options within each one. So starting with recycled water, what we call non-potable reuse, there's two options that have been developed. The first is to take effluent from the Las Colinas Valley Sanitation District wastewater treatment plant and put it into an existing or expand an existing distribution system, the tertiary distribution system, and provide that water to the Peacock Gap Golf Course. The second option is essentially take water from the CMSA uh, wastewater treatment plant and provide tertiary reclaimed water to the San Quentin facility. 
These facilities combined only produce about 300 acre feet of water per year, so relatively small flows. And given that these are tertiary facilities, uh, that water usage is going to be seasonal. It's going to be greater in the summer than it would be in the winter. So a relatively small amount of reclaimed water from that option. The second option, which we're calling indirect potable use, essentially utilize water from all three of the uh, wastewater treatment plants, Las Colinas, CMSA, and the Sewerage Agency of, of South Marin. And that would produce about seven MGD or almost 8,000 acre feet of water. Here we'd essentially bring the water from the two other wastewater treatment facilities to CMSA's facility, combine that effluent, build a advanced water treatment facility at CMSA's site, and that water would then be pumped or conveyed out to Kent Lake rather long distribution pipeline to get it there. The reason we're choosing Kent Lake as a receiving body is because it has a large enough volume that we can meet the regulatory requirements to be able to be classified this as a reservoir or surface water augmentation facility, which reduces the amount of treatment we have to do. So the advanced treatment process would consist of microfiltration, reverse osmosis, an ultraviolet light with advanced oxidation. And that would give us our purified water that would then be conveyed up to Kent Lake for mixing with the existing surface water supply. The third option, which we've considered is basically to do advanced treatment and put the water into, uh, into a stream, in this case, Oscalinas, and directly discharge it for environmental release or augmentation into the stream. The challenge with that is, is that the temperature of secondary effluent or purified water in this case is going to be greater than what is allowed in the discharge and the release. And we really don't have any way to, practically speaking, reduce that temperature. It's also going to have to be purified, just like we talked about for Kent Lake's option. So at the end of the day, it makes more sense rather than trying to do an environmental release directly is to put that water into Kent Lake, blend it with the surface water supply, mitigate or modulate the temperature issue and use that water to release to the stream instead. So it really becomes, rather than a separate option, becomes part of option two. The fourth option here is what we call direct potable use. And there's two versions of that. The first one, which we call raw water augmentation, would essentially take water from all three of the wastewater treatment plants, treat it to a high level, higher level than the one I talked about in option two, and then convey that water to Bontempe Lake. Because Bontempe Lake is smaller, it doesn't have the ability to dilute and to retain for longer periods of time that water compared to Kent Lake. So we have to do a higher level of treatment. We have to not only do microfiltration reverse osmosis and UVAOP, we also have to do ozone and BAC. So even higher level of treatment at work cost in order to meet the regulatory requirements for what we call raw water augmentation into Von Temp Lake. The other direct potable option involves taking water, locating an advanced treatment facility at the CMSA wastewater treatment plant, treating that to a very high level, and then introducing that directly into the distribution system, the potable water distribution system. That's referred to as treated water augmentation. It would utilize the same process I just talked about for water being discharged to Bon Tempe, except there's going to be additional requirements because you're talking about direct introduction into the, treated, into the distribution system. The, the uh, Bon Tempe Lake would generate about 8,000 acre feet of water, and the uh, direct distribution or treated water mutation will generate about 4,500 acre feet of water for those options. So if we look at the water considerations here with respect to water reuse, first to point out that the options I talked about for direct water reuse or even indirect water reuse going to Kent Lake, there are no existing operational facilities that do this. There are some underway, such as San Diego's Pure Water Program, which will do surface water augmentation. There are some discussions and planning purposes around doing raw water augmentation. 
in Southern California as well. No one at this point is looking at doing treated water augmentation. So we really don't have any existing facilities by which to look at, judge the operational requirements and whatever issues and lesson learns there are around doing these types of uh, portal release projects. Must also be pointed out that we're starting with secondary effluent. We have a number of trace contaminants or organics present in that supply. And even though we're going to this high level of treatment, as I described previously, there are still going to be trace levels of those contaminants present in the purified water. We can't do 100% removal. So that must be kept in mind with respect to whether those trace levels down in the nanogram per meter level represent any kind of a concern uh, in using these options. On the permitting side, in addition to getting these projects permitted with division of drinking water, given that these are new projects, which is not a minor detail, we also have to look at permitting of the discharge of the RO brine from these facilities. Again, all these potable reuse facilities use RO, and they're going to contain higher concentrations of those organics that are present in the effluent. So we're concentrating those up and they're going to be present in, those, in that effluent or the brine going into the bay. Then, of course, public acceptance is critical. Whenever we start with secondary effluent or wastewater, uh, we have to recognize that there's always some concerns about the acceptance of starting with that water supply and producing drinking water from it. And that's going to have to be addressed, obviously, to make sure that if we move forward with water reuse options, water reuse, that that's been and properly addressed. Uh, because we're using reverse osmosis as well as a number of other uh, treatment processes, the energy consumption here is not minor. It's not as high as bay water desalination, but it's not insignificant either. And with that comes obviously cost to build these advanced water treatment facilities and moving water to the lakes is gonna require conveyance costs as well. So on the water reuse options, like I showed for desalination, uh, we have the cost listed here. Uh, these are also being refined and will also end up with a range of costs for these options, as I described for desalination. We can see here that depending upon the option, the cost can be quite low for option 1A and 1B, but again, we're not gain gaining much water from those options. Um, so low cost, but low, low gain in terms of water supply augmentation. And then <clears throat> the regional option two here going IPR because of the cost involved conveyance, moving water to AWT and then up to the lake is quite high with the cost of, I'm sorry, I didn't realize we took the cost out of here. My apologies, I was referring to the, uh, the yields. Um, yeah, Jim, so uh, just, just following on that note. so. In terms of option two for IPR, I think there's some some question we would want to firm up the yield before we move forward yes. with developing the cost per acre foot there. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of similar on on the, the DPR option. So for, for this option, I think it's um, maybe a better classification that we're, we're still working through the yields and, and, and costs. So that, that's okay. sort of where we're at at the moment. Appreciate that, yes. Thank you. I, I didn't mention the fact that we may not have enough wastewater available, <clears throat> particularly with conservation, to actually provide 7840 acre feet from the three wastewater treatment plants. Armin, I think I'm turning it back over to you now. Okay, great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so the next set of, of options were that we kind of category of options that we looked at or alternatives were water purchases essentially from outside of, of, of the region with conveyance through Bay Interties. And we looked at, uh, at four different concepts there. Uh, one is the, is the East Bay Mud Intertie, which would involve purchase of water from the Sacramento, Sacramento Valley, willing sellers to, to sell water that uh, would be conveyed um, across the Delta through Contra Costa's system and our East Bay Mud system. Uh, with a with a new pipeline across the bridge and, and pump station associated with it, um, a kind of a variant of that is looking at could we tie into Contra Costa's system um, directly 
in lieu of, of going through East Bay MUD's um, system directly. But essentially the same concept of a Sac Valley purchase during a during a, the triggers of a dry year, look for purchasing of water and conveyance of that water across the Delta through the East Bay Motor, the Contra Costa systems, and then delivery of that water across across the bridge into, into Marin. Uh, the third uh, the third option that we looked at is the potential for um, doing an intertie with the North Bay Aqueduct. So in this case, we're not crossing crossing the bridge. There would be an extent, uh, extension of the North Bay Aqueduct, or essentially an intertie connected from the North Bay Aqueduct. And we looked at two variants of that: one that would bring water directly uh, to Marin uh, through a through a conveyance uh, pipeline, and then another one that would uh, deliver water through Sonoma <clears throat> and essentially do an, uh, develop a regional system, regional supply that could be delivered through Sonoma Waters Aqueduct System. Uh, but both of those would involve uh, identifying treatment, um, treated water capacity at, 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 um, at Napa's water treatment plant, uh, a conveyance pipeline to deliver water um, into the system. And finally, the one that we are still doing some work on is looking at the possibility of, of an intertie with uh, San Francisco Public Utility Commission and, and an intertie across the Golden Gate Bridge. We, we envision this will not generate a huge amount of, of supply, but we're still kind of doing our due diligence on evaluating that option. Uh, with all of, with many of these options, they're they involve wheeling of water through uh, other entities systems, either whether it's East Bay Mud or Contra Costa or North Bay Aqueduct systems. Um, East Bay Mud has uh, put out some wheeling principles that limit it, perhaps limit the, the potential for operations to um, only under emergency considerations. Um, and some of their, some of their restrictions may be limiting in, in the ability for this that effort to move forward. Um, all of them involve conveyance through multiple jurisdictions, whether it's through across the Delta or through East Bay Mud or Contra Costa or, or, or Napa or San Francisco. And that that has considerations in terms of impacts and, and, uh, and potential partnerships that would have to be in, involved. Uh, the third bullet here just talks about the ability to potentially connect to Contra Costa rather than East Bay Mud. Uh, that's one of the alternatives that we looked at. And then uh, the looking at the permitting requirements, depending on how, how these projects are implemented. First off, the permitting of, of moving water across um, from Sacramento Valley into the system will require some permitting. There's a loss of water as it crosses the Delta a term called carriage water, which is to manage salinity flows in the Delta. So some water is lost. And then finally, uh, permitting of, of the conveyance in order to bring the water into Marin system. The yield uncertainty and droughts, um, there is a concern there that many entities may be in the water market at the same time, looking for supply simultaneously during droughts. Um, and whether that water is available for, for purchase and whether the, those agreements are developed in place. And obviously costs cost associated with drought year purchases will be particularly high or substantially higher than, than a normal year purchase agreement. And, and the loss of water across the Delta will increase the cost of those options. Uh, we, again, we're looking at the, these options here, the costs because some of these yield numbers um, may be refined here, the costs are, are not fully conveyed yet. We have the capital costs associated with developing the intertie concepts, um, the O&M cost to deliver water across or through the conveyance and, and to the systems. And then we've annualized those costs, but the yield numbers are still um, in development in that, we'll, in that we're looking at, at informing ourselves on how they that water could be purchased and in an ideal scenario you're purchasing water in years in advance of a drought not just during the drought year um, per se 
and some of that water might be stored in the reservoirs and some of it could be lost through if the drought doesn't uh, actually uh, come to fruition. Um, in some years, it may be, you may lose some of that water. In other years, it will, it'll serve its purpose exactly as intended. So those yield numbers are, are still in progress as we look to um, build that into the model more fully. Well, the next set of options, we're looking at local storage augmentation. Uh, we've done a substantial review of, of past studies and, and the potential for new um, reservoir storage to be developed. Either uh, the one that looks most promising from, from past work has been uh, raising Sulahuli Dam for additional storage development. Uh, we've looked also at um, dredging of Nicasio Lake to remove some of the sediment and generate additional storage capacity in that manner. And then finally, the third grouping of options is looking at, at the potential for adjustable or movable spillways that could essentially increase the storage capacity by one, two, three, up to five feet of, of elevation increase in, in some of the reservoirs. Um, in each of these, we're looking at the dam adequacy and structural integrity in order to implement um, either a dam raise or a, a movable uh, spillway concepts. We've done some initial inundation mapping for for um, the Sulahuli enlargement potential and looking at the potential inundation areas and, and how that might play out um, with respect to land ownership and impacts to existing uses. Um, any of the enlargement options will very likely um, involve permitting both from Division of Safety of Dams from, from a kind of a safety integrity standpoint and a water rights issue in terms of increasing the potential diversion to storage from the state board. Um, and then the environmental issues associated with potential enlargements. Um, most of the, the reservoirs have release requirements downstream. And are though, if we were to implement enlargements, will those release requirements uh, stay the same or will they be also be modified in the future? Those are considerations that we're exploring. Uh, we've looked we developed uh, initial cost estimates for, for raising Sulahuli and dredging Nicasio, building off of uh, previous work. Um, uh, raising Sulahuli Dam um, generated, you know, generates, could generate a substantial amount of yield, but that storage that it creates doesn't necessarily translate into dry year yield. Uh, we think the costs are likely in the, in the order of, of $2,000 to $2,500 an acre foot for raising Sulahuli. Dredging of Nicasio was quite an expensive um, option in that it that yield would likely um, disappear after some amount of time and in, in that it would sedimentation would again fill up that portion of that portion of the storage. So you'd have some yield pot potential for a number of years, but that would not be a long-term sustained yield. And then finally, the, the movable spillway gates, we have kind of a high range or a high range of cost estimates, some that are quite inexpensive looking at, like, for example, North Marin is looking at um, Stafford Lake movable spillway gates. And that particular dam is, is kind of ideally suited for, for movable spillway gates because of its structure and its design. Um, a number of other dams have quite substantial uh, costs associated with within implementing movable spillway gates. We have a fairly high range. We're doing some ad additional work to identify which which dams in particular could be most suitable and what is the relative cost on each of those dams as we look at the configuration of their spillways. So we've initiated that work to refine the costs. Yeah, I would just add Armin to that discussion on on local storage options that the, the yield really um, you know, it, we need to understand how, what our operational rules for the reservoirs would be in terms of how they uh, would translate, as you said, into sort of dry year yields. Um, so the, those operational rules will, will, as we go through those in the next few weeks, will really help us inform uh, what the, the yield we can expect from these options is. And of course, with the movable spillway gates, 
um, if the structural analysis would reveal that a, a higher than five foot um, spillway, adjustable spillway dam would work, then, then that's what we would pursue there as well. So um, just, just some uh, additional unknowns with, with local storage. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I believe the last group of options that we're uh, going to talk about here is the Sonoma Marin, what we're calling Sonoma Marin Partnerships, um, essentially exploring the potential to maximize use of Sonoma water in winter. In, protect, in particular, this is, a, um, is an option that could be implemented with existing infrastructure. There's no uh, new investments needed necessarily to make for option number one is more of a policy to maximize that, that take. And, and I know the district is, has been doing that this year in particular with Castania um, improvements to try to maximize that, that take of water during dry conditions, but in, in, in dry years, but in winter, uh, winter excess flows. Uh, the option two is looking at the potential for dedicated um, conveyance to, of Sonoma water to, um, delivery to Sulahuli or Nicasio Reservoir. So this would be an independent pipeline that would deliver water uh, directly to those reservoirs. Currently, Sonoma Water's delivery into Marin goes into the, into the conveyance and distribution system directly and not, cannot be stored. So this would provide an option to store water in, in Marin reservoirs. Uh, the third option is uh, something that Sonoma Water is developing right now. They are are rehabilitating three of their wells in the Santa Rosa Plain to increase the, the potential, the yield of, of their aqueduct system. Um, I think this is likely to, to support Sonoma Water in the development of that, of that program and, and identify whether a specific yield out of those wells could be assigned or aligned to, to help support Marin's uh, drought resiliency. And then finally, the option four is looking at regional groundwater bank. Um, um, this is a concept that is in active discussion throughout the, the region, looking at potential groundwater banks in Santa Rosa Plain, uh, Petaluma Valley, and Sonoma Valley. And this concept would, would look to store water in those, um, in those groundwater basins during wet periods and be able to extract from those great groundwater basins during dry periods. Uh, it could either be a physical movement of water that gets pumped into the aqueduct system, or it could be done through virtual or exchanges with overlying landowners and, and parties there. Uh, this is a, a very active concept that we're kind of exploring very much at a conceptual level at this point. Uh, some of the considerations for the Sonoma Marin partnerships are, um, in particular on the groundwater banking side, there are uh, groundwater sustainability agencies that have all developed groundwater sustainability plans for those three basins. Uh, many of them are, are looking to implement ASR or aquifer storage and recovery in which water is pumped into the ground, um, stored, and then, then taken out at a later point. So there are kind of alignment with those overlying pumpers um, to the extent those could be developed into an actual program is, is still a bit of a question. And then these exchange agreements and accounting systems would have to be developed in order to, to implement the, the banking concept overall and ensure that we're tracking and monitoring uh, water levels in those basins and the, the put and take of water associated with each of the entities participating in a bank. Uh, for, uh, for the options in which we are looking to maximize or increase the, the take of, of water from, from Sonoma Water Aqueduct, the purchase of additional water, um, whether it's put into a reservoir, a marine reservoir, if those years end up not being as dry as, as envisioned, there's the potential for some of that water that was purchased to be spilled. And, that, and that's kind of a risk trade-off that would have to be um, um, discussed and that's where we're heading towards and how frequently might it spill what are the types of conditions in which you might want to purchase additional water um, essentially achieving resiliency will involve taking some additional risk of spill and finding that right trade-off is uh, is important for this these set of options 
Uh, we've developed cost estimates for for all of these, and some are still in in flux. But uh, for example, option one is is maximizing use of winter water. There's no new facilities that are developed under this particular option, and and the costs are associated with with purchase of water from Sonoma Water currently. Uh, as we move into larger infrastructure and conveyance, we'll have higher costs of dedicated conveyance. Uh, these numbers are still in flux as well, but, but substantial conveyance might be needed. Uh, the Sonoma Water Well Rehabilitation is a project that is actively being developed by Sonoma Water. Currently, the county, uh, Sonoma County Water Agency or Sonoma Water um, and then how much yield might be developed specifically for Marin out of those options is, is still unknown. Um, and then from the groundwater bank standpoint, we've developed kind of high level estimates of, of costs associated with it. We're doing some refinement and we'll be doing some additional modeling to determine how much potential dry year yield could be developed for Marin out of a, out of a banking option. Okay, I think with that, Paul, I'm going to stop and hand it to you. Is that right? Yeah, thanks, Armin. Um, so uh, as we wrap up, um, we still have a lot of work in progress. And, and the, the next few weeks, our goals are really to, to nail down the yield and costs and understand these water management alternatives. <clears throat> Additionally, um, uh, a, a detailed review and consideration of conservation as a water management alternative. And we'll, we'll be taking the, the sort of first step there on um, August 2nd, uh, on Tuesday, we'll have a discussion item with the board where we'll run through uh, the conservation um, program that we see uh, in, that's included in the scenarios that Armin has run through this evening. And uh, we'll, we'll also be developing uh, some detailed evaluation criteria. But there is a fair amount of work ahead of us in terms of the, the yield and cost and getting those numbers uh, hard and fast so that we can uh, start evaluating uh, the water management alternatives. Next slide. I think uh, it talks about our schedule upcoming. As I mentioned, August 2nd, we have conservation, uh, detailed discussion with the board on that as a, as a water management alternative. And then on September 13th, we'll be coming back uh, to present a detailed review of the Marin Sonoma partnerships, and then an overall review of all of the water management options and uh, how they perform in, in terms of uh, reducing or eliminating deficits. And then we're sort of reserving the 27th of September and October 18th, not yet, uh, want to put out what the topic will be because I want to see how, how we do August 2nd and September 13th in terms of any follow-up that's needed from those. And in uh, public meetings, we'll continue to have these. So public workshop number four will be sometime in October or, or likely October when we've got some meaningful information to, to share. I think uh, then that sort of concludes our presentation this evening. If you go to the next slide, Armin, I think it has some uh, questions and way, way to ask questions and comments that Adrian maybe can run us through. Uh, yeah, we'll open for questions and comments now. And uh, just a reminder to those that aren't familiar with participating in Zoom meetings, uh, raise your hand if you're on a computer or smart device. And if you are on dial-in, press star nine, and Terry's going to go through hands one by one. Um, if you think of a question after you've already asked one, just raise your hand again, and we'll get back to you once we've given everyone a first try. All right, Terry, you can take it away. Okay, the first three that I see, uh, Mr. Roger Roberts and Director Schmidt and Mr. Jamison. Those three in order, please. Mr. Roberts. Yes, thank you. Uh, I didn't realize I'd be first. <laughs> uh, uh, some comments uh, that I would like to present uh, are as follows. Uh, and uh, so here they are. One of the things that I think would be important to present as part of these uh, discussions uh, for each of the options to actually explain how long it will take to implement each of the various options. Uh, 
Uh, that's a very serious consideration, especially if we decide uh, as a community and at the district uh, to pursue uh, options that will help uh, achieve resiliency for a four-year drought condition. And if, if it's a four-year drought condition uh, and you apply that to each of the options, uh, knowing how long it's going to take to implement each of the options is clearly going to affect costs and uh, expectations on reliability. And then I have a, a question, uh, and that is associated with a, another option, which I somehow is uh, disappeared. Uh, there are a number of projects uh, being pursued uh, by East Bay agencies for expanding reservoir storage. Uh, and I just wonder if there's a possibility for MMWD to participate in the costs of doing that and thereby getting entitlements to the water that is so uh, increased water supply that is now being stored. And why isn't that something that we ought to be considering? So those are my comments for today and I, I hope they're helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Roger. Um, I, I guess I'll start, Armin, you feel free to jump in. Um, in terms of expanding the, those East Bay reservoirs, I think you're referring to right sites and then of course, um, Los Vaqueros. And both of those for us really play into the intertie options. And those are some of the things when we talk about trying to understand how we should think about yield for those interties, that those are some of the questions that we're wrestling with. So it, it, it's an excellent point and, and a good question. And I, I do appreciate your comments. And just to maybe follow up on the first on the first comment that, that was mentioned, I. I think that's, that's a great comment. We have, a, we've not shown it here. We have a set of evaluation criteria that we're working through and, and number one or two on that list is, is the uh, implementation timeline. So we're actively working through how much, how long would it take to, to develop the concept, to design, to permit, to implement, and to have it actually become operational. As I, I do agree that, that the timing may be major drivers in particular when you're looking at, at drought management options. Um, I think there's some realization that our, many of these options would have to be generating some supply in advance of a drought and that water would have to be managed in a, in a different manner to provide future drought benefits. So that's kind of the integration into the system component. Very good comments though, thank you. Thank you. Um, Director Schmidt, please. Hi, uh, thanks very much. Good evening. Um, again, really um, thought provoking um, presentation that um, I hope is, I think is, it was well laid out and, and I think hopefully um, helps all the folks who have tuned in to understand better the, the different alternatives we're looking at. Um, I, I wanna just echo Roger Roberts comments that it would be really great to, to see other screening criteria in ARM and I'm glad to hear that, that you folks are working on that. Um, time to implement is really important. Um, drought resilience, uh, I think, you know, is something we look, we talked about with with increasing surface storage. That uh, increasing surface storage uh, in you know in the face of a drought may not generate as much yield as we, obviously if we we're in a series of wet years. Um, so I'll be looking forward to those screening criteria. I think that will really help folks to see a more complete picture. But um, you know, on that topic of time to implement and. This is a comment that I, I somewhat provided at a previous meeting is, as part of our analysis, we're looking at about 30,000 acre feet of, of existing storage that is, you know, is unavailable in one way or the other. Either it's it, mechanically, it is difficult to, to, to access as dead pool storage or is of questionable water quality, such that we don't know reliably that it is, it seems that it's accessible because of, of some sort of water quality constraints. Um, that's a pretty substantial quantity of water that's that's there, that's that's in the system that 
isn't accessible. And I think that it would be really helpful if we could uh, look at what would be the cost um, and, and treatment necessary to access, say, 10,000 of that acre feet. Um, it might be more, uh, it might be a solution that is cost effective. It also might be more re readily, um, might be um, more implementable in a shorter time frame. just going to that, that concern about cost, because some of these, some of the projects we've talked about will take a decade or more um, to implement. So a, a concern about something that we already have in hand, whether that presents itself an opportunity. Um, the last thing, and, and I know I'm kind of giving a tier of, of things to respond to it. Uh, uh, lastly, the Sonoma Marin Partnership, you know, I think a, a question about that concern of, of, um, of taking water and that that could, that water that we take could result, it could be, could spill should we get um, a, you know, a wetter water year type. And I'm wondering whether as part of that partnership, we're looking at the ability to actually store and leave water in the ground banked in uh, the Sonoma Marin, you know, the Sonoma area, such that we take it when we need it and, and is, is not, wouldn't be a subject of spills. Thanks again. You wanna go first, Paul? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab maybe going backwards. Um, I, I think that's a, an excellent point, Director Schmidt. Uh, groundwater banking does help with that sort of notion of, of, of purchasing water ahead of time, you know, when you may perhaps think it's going to be a dry year and it turns out to be wetter than uh, we had envisioned, like Carmen had said. If, if that water is stored in the groundwater bank, um, there's less risk of, of losing it. Of course, the groundwater bank typically you don't get back everything that you put in. There's there's typically a, a sort of a, a if you like a, a payment to the to the bank itself um, mm -hmm. for, for being allowed to leave the water there. Um, and then, in terms of the the thirty thousand acre feet, yeah, that that's being sort of established just as a operational threshold. Um, you know, given what we saw in the most recent drought emergency, and uh, the the condition of storage of the reservoir in sort of mid-October of 2021, when we were approaching 23,000 acre feet of water, really didn't afford us much time to take any action. And, and so that's why we were moving forward under kind of an emergency basis for, for the intertie option at that time. So the, the 30,000 acre feet is really a level that allows us maybe a little bit more time to uh, develop emergency plans should they you know should a drought maybe extend a year beyond for example the four-year severe drought that we've uh, sort of um, proposed as the as the as the um, worst case if you like scenario yeah I, I mean to be clear I'm not suggesting that we we rely on that as our solution by any means but I right. think that if if we I, I want to make sure that should we find ourselves in that situation where we do need to access that that we have planned ahead which is what the purpose of our of our effort here so that we can access that that water whether it, again it's a water quality treatment um, uh, solution or some sort of, of infrastructure to be able to access and move water around sufficiently. So Got it. That, that's the part that I think would be, might be another wise part of the analysis for, for us to look at. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ed Jamison, then 1402, please. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. First, I'd like to acknowledge the complexity of what you Jacobs folks are dealing with here. I have two simple questions and some comments. Tonight's presentation says drought scenarios three through five include supplemental water with Castania pump station rehabilitation. I believe it was previously stated that the drought scenarios would assume only 4,000 acre feet from Sonoma during extended drought, including winter water, which sounds reasonable to me or perhaps even optimistic. This is a critical assumption in drought and it should be explicitly stated, perhaps in a footnote. So that is a first question. About the East Bay Mud intertie slide and the restrictive principles for its operation, those principles could result in a reasonable estimate of average yield being only about 500 acre feet annually, not the 9,000 acre feet that has been shown, suggesting a cost of something like $19,000 per acre foot, not the $2,200 cost that was shown last week. 
The principles would prevent the pipeline from being used in droughts to preserve our reservoir water, and they require water to be used only for indoor use. So use of the pipeline would effectively require that we kill much or most of Marin's landscaping. Meanwhile, we would also be required to contribute to East Bay MUD's low income subsidy programs for its 1.4 million users, including the city of Oakland. The East Bay MUD intertie would be a financial disaster and we need to plan for drought resilience without this pipeline. And it is not clear that water would even be available to purchase in drought. And as for the Contra Costa intertie last week, it was not clear to me whether the $280 million cost estimate included $111 million for the Richmond San Rafael bridge pipeline. It should. So that's a second question. Switching to desal, the $302 million cost estimate for a 5 MGD desal plant is two and a half to three times the cost of same sized Antioch and Doheny. The costs are also twice what was estimated just last fall, including a 30% contingency pad at a time when we were already well into COVID related supply chain and labor shortages. Jacob's July 12th slides use round words to describe how our local desal might be more expensive than Antioch and Doheny. We need to be told numbers, not just round words to quantify such possible differences. Likely only two or three such items like pre-treatment plant not required in Antioch, $8 million, explaining possible cost differences. Without such explanations, these desal cost estimates just do not seem credible. Thank you for considering my comments and I look forward to your answers to my two questions were, which were 4,000 acre feet from Sonoma and drought question, and did the $280 million CCW, CCWD intertie include $111 million for the bridge pipeline? Thanks again. Um, Armin, do you want to tackle any of those? Yeah, I can. Um, I'll leave the desal ones for Jim to tackle. But yeah, the, yeah, the first question on the Castania pump station and, and the supplemental supply. Uh, in the modeling, we assume that there's, I think it's Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, 5,300 acre feet of a of minimum purchased, except in some years in which it drops to 4,300. Correct. Um, and then in, in very dry years, when storage falls below, uh, I'm forgetting our threshold now, I believe it's 30,000 acre feet in local storage, we yeah. do maximize that purchase. So that could be much up to nine, roughly 9,000 acre feet in those years. So it's a variable, it's a variable condition. In general, it's between 4,300 and 5,300 acre feet per year. But during very dry conditions, uh, we implement a uh, essentially a modeling um, aspect to take a, a larger amount of water to bolster local supply. And that that could be based on winter water availability, right? As it was this year when there was tremendous flows in, in the Russian River, but local storage in Lake Sonoma is relatively low. Um, and, and so we were using Castania somewhat this year as well. Um, and then I think the other question um, Mr. Jameson had was about uh, Contra Costa and the, the cost, whether it included the intertie cost. And I, I think it did. But yeah, and that one didn't, all of the ones that were moving water across either East Bay Mud or Contra Costa include the cost for uh, the pipeline across the bridge. Right, right. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, thanks. Uh, Paul, I would, or Paul or Armin, my question about uh, Sonoma water was really, what is your assumption in an extended drought? I thought a couple, a few weeks ago, you said the assumption was 4,000 acre feet in an extended drought was probably about all we could reliably expect, including winter water. I'm, I'm aware of the contractual conditions that we've had for years now, but it's, my question is, what are you assuming in an extended drought? Yeah, I think the model, Armin, you want to take that? It's really a, what's in the model at this yeah. point. But. So it's it's a little bit more dynamic, um, Mr. Jamison, on, on those, during those drought conditions, we are, we have a, a simulation of Sonoma water available supply on the Russian River, and we're essentially maximizing the, the take of Sonoma water under those really low storage conditions. So it could be up to 9,000 um, acre feet per year, but in general, that is, it's uh, maybe one one year of nine thousand, and then it drops back down to to the fifty three hundred um, minimum take limit. 
So I don't know if that makes sense, Mr. Jameson, but it, it's kind of a complex model that includes the whole Sonoma um, watershed. And so the, the model will sort of automatically assess whether the water is available for us to take uh, from, from Sonoma. I think uh, I get it. No, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that answered it. Thanks. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Jameson. Number 1402, then Chuck Ballinger, please. Uh, J James Holmes, Larkspur. Um, the local storage option looks better all the time in light of the uh, technicalities and costs of the other options. My question, uh, why is the local storage focus so limited? Um, why uh, are we ta uh, looking o at raising the dam only at Sulahuli? Why are we looking at dredging only at Nicasio? And most significant, why are we not looking at any new reservoirs, which would seem to be the simplest and uh, uh, most uh, satisfactory approach? Uh, in this connection, I note that uh, one uh, director stated in the newspaper, uh, we should consider a non-creek reservoir in Marin, which would be used to store some uh, Russian River winter water benefiting all three uh, water districts. Uh, so uh, those are my questions. And I guess my final question is, is the primary impediment to a new reservoir the requirement to make releases under the 95, 1995 uh, water release order? And if that is our primary obstacle, uh, why aren't we strategizing ways to free ourselves from that straitjacket? Thank you. Um, a, a lot of questions. I don't know that I got them all. Um, so why why are we only looking at raising Sulahuli Dam? Um, we, we we did present some analysis earlier that that showed inflows to the different reservoirs, um, and, and very simplistically and on an average basis. And, and Sulahuli does seem to have, um, you know, the ability to raise the dam and for the amount of capacity that we would get out of it, it seems to be the most favorable one. Um, in terms of new reservoirs, uh, I think it, it would it would most likely be a lot easier to to raise the dam on Sulahuli than construct a new reservoir. Um, There's a small matter when when of course we build new reservoirs, you need to inundate a very large area of land and. It, it, while there there is a fair amount of land in Marin, um, I think a, a new reservoir might meet with with some some opposition. Not that that's the uh, defining reason why, but, but there just isn't a, a good location um, for us to site a reservoir that would have any kind of a supply to it. Um, and so I, I don't think it's just just the impediment of potentially new releases from any new reservoir that, that's stopping it. Um, but we, we did look at some historical information concerning potential sites for new reservoirs. And uh, I think it was Marcelo that ran through some of the reasons for those. And I think the, the last most promising site for a reservoir was Sulahuli itself. Uh, and that was constructed around 1980. Uh, I think I missed one of the questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, dredging, wh why not consideration oh. of dredging other uh, uh, lakes than, than Nicasio? Um, I, <clears throat> I think it really just came down to, you know, the, the shape of lakes, when you look at, at lakes, and, and particularly Nicasio is a fairly wide, shallow lake. Um, and if you think of the other reservoirs on the mountain, they're typically fairly deep and sort of V-shaped. So if you were to try to excavate, say, Kent Reservoir, you don't have much storage down the bottom of a reservoir like that. So you would want to excavate Nicasio preferentially. And then as we got into it, the, the dredging of, of Nicasio, the costs alone are, are, are you know, pretty astronomical in terms of the return for water supply. Yes, I recall that. Uh, thank you very much.
So no, no, no new reserv- no space for new reservoirs in, in, in your analysis. Yeah, from, from the documentation that we have, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chuck Ballinger, please. And then Larry Minikis. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. I am very much in favor of raising Sula Huli, as some of you know. And I think while most of the options you've presented tonight have great potential, uh, they're all problematic, let's face it. And historically, our water supply in Marin has always been our reservoirs, and more recently, 25% from Sonoma. On the presentation tonight, I'm most intrigued with the winter water from Russian River and how that might be transferred by a dedicated conveyance to Sula Huli. I think this is the closest thing I could come up to with a no brainer. How can you lose by making that inner tie to Sula Huli, which I understand is also connected to Nicasio Lake. What concerns me though, is the disparity between the cost projections on the 2040 water supply plan, which comes in at $2,100 an acre foot and a yield of 4,000 acre feet. And the Jacobs report, which almost triples the cost per acre foot and lowers the yield to 2,800. Now in looking that, and I've been a contractor for 40 years, I don't get the breakdown. The annual operating and maintenance cost is over 3 million. I have to assume that's in addition to what the existing cost is. And if that's so, Once the dam is raised, I I don't see how that number changes that much. And the other question I'd have is your total annualized cost of 16 million. Now, Jacobs came up with a number of 148 million, which is, uh, I suppose, a projection or a draft. But to me, that is the line item that we should be looking at when comparing it to the 2040 resource plan. So the basis of my question is, How do you account for that extreme disparity? It it almost seems like Jacobs is padding the numbers to make it less attractive. Currently, I think Sulahuli Dam is by far the best bang for the buck. And as Armin mentioned and the dedicated conveyance to Sulahuli, I I just think that's something that could be done as soon as possible. I know you've got some water rights issues potentially with Walker Creek, but uh, again, I'm totally in favor of Sulahuli. I just am concerned about the cost difference. Thank you. Armin, do you want to speak to how we developed the cost for that yeah, option? I, yeah, I can shed a little light on it, although I don't have all the numbers in front of me. But the first option of raising the Sulahuli Dam, I, I believe, was very similar to the 2040 plan. We've escal- we essentially escalated those costs um, up to 2022 numbers. I think it's the the con, the question you had was large the dedicated conveyance um, to Sulahuli, the second option, and that one um, involves quite a bit of infrastructure. So included in that is is a um, what's what was on the table called a south transmission system from Sonoma Water Aqueduct, which essentially was an additional conveyance pipeline to to get around some of the bottlenecks of Sonoma Water Aqueduct, and then a a dedicated conveyance to go from the aqueduct all the way to to Sululi Reservoir. So, and that 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 uh, dedicated conveyance, I do not believe was was envisioned in in the 2040 plan. So that's that's a newer concept. It's a slightly different concept than what was considered in the 2040 plan. I see. So the the dedicated conveyance is part of the Jacobs report. And it wasn't part of the 2040 plan. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Only the enlargement. The enlargement of Sulahuli by itself was in the 2040, but not the, not coupled with the conveyance or not the conveyance itself. And the Jacobs report comes in at a cost of acre foot for raising Sulahuli at 5,900 versus 2,100. Do you expect that? Uh, I think in, in a slide you had, it was down to 2,300. What, what's going on with this incredible disparity? Is it just to do with the conveyance? No, I, I think it has more to do with the yield. Um, <clears throat> and so I think there were some sort of simplifying assumptions made in the 2040 report that 
that arrived at, at the 4,000 acre foot yield number. And we're looking at um, what, what some of the, the last set of numbers that we looked at, um, I forget when was that, Mark Marcello presented, I think. Um, and he, he was talking about yield of the project in terms of reducing shortage or deficits. Um, and so that, that, that has a set of operational assumptions as to how we would utilize Sulahuli. And that's one of the reasons we need to maybe go into the model and, and change how we would optim how we would use Sulahuli if we were to raise it and to purchase water. And I think those yield numbers will change and consequently the cost per acre foot will change as well. So um, Paul, I, I just wanted to mention, yeah. um, you know, the word padding the costs and um, th there's no incentive for Jacobs <laughs> to pad any of these costs. And we've heard um, concerns of folks that prefer desal or are interested in desal that those costs seem too high. Local storage, those costs seem too high. I was talking to someone who said, the DPR costs are way too high. Um, and so um, I, I think they're trying to um, reflect the current climate we're in, the current costs that we're seeing in construction that have gone way up. And we all are taken, including Jacobs, a bit surprised at what the costs are coming in at. Um, but there is no padding. There's no thumb on any scale here. We're all interested in the same thing, which is finding the best option for the community to increase our water resiliency and security. And then lastly, costs get refined over time. So as we build the roadmap and we explore pre-design of different options, these costs will get more and more refined. And that's something we'll keep in mind and continue to talk about as we look at these options. And we'll look at ranges of costs because they are a range of costs. Um, but the, the, this is, um, you, you're seeing work in progress. So some numbers have changed a bit and they're still changing. It's a balance of real time sharing with the community where we are, what we're doing at the same time, it's difficult because as refinements happen, changes happen, and it should not, maybe for some it does, reflect on the credibility. In fact, it's kind of the opposite in my view. It shows the progress of work and the robustness we're trying to strive for the information that then goes into developing the roadmap. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Larry Minikis and then Phil Sauter, please. Armin, Jim, I, I want to thank you for the presentation this evening. It, it's always informative when, when you both present, when, when the team presents. And Ben, you were reading my mind. I was going to speak to exactly the same thing, I, but I'm going to speak to it as, for, as a public advocate and just say it's really unfortunate language to use that kind of language in a public meeting unless you have proof of something like this. I, I, it's, it's accusatory and it was inappropriate, shouldn't have happened. And I also feel that anyone that is at this point picking favorites is picking too early. We're too early in the race. There's still far too much to learn. And I would encourage the public to take a breath, take time, and let's go through this process where we can really find what are the best um, positions for us to uh, adopt. Um, I'm gonna to speak to the Sonoma Marin Partnership. And what I started asking myself is, well, what do the residents of Sonoma gain from this? And I think there obviously are gonna be public meetings on their end to discuss exactly the same kind of partnership. And I think we have to really vet that out so that um, in a partnership, both sides have to get something, hopefully of equal value, but something that they both want. And I obviously what we get is clear. We're gonna get the water we need when we need it. Um, what they get obviously is gonna be some sort of monetary gain from this or maybe some other partnership where you know, I think ratepayers might wanna know here, how much are we going to contribute to say the, the groundwater storage option, ground, groundwater banking option. 
So that, that on that uh, one point, um, I'm really happy to see that conservation is really baked into this, is included in, in these numbers, that we're thinking forward, that we're gonna to continue to find ways to better conserve. We're never gonna hit zero, obviously, but we can always do a better job in, in years to come. And then on the final one, um, containerized desal. Uh, Jim mentioned it could be easily a seven year permitting process and possibly 12, 15 year process. And let's say we um, are thinking about scenario five where we have a catastrophic uh, fire along with a, a multi-year drought and we lose capacity of some sort or another. Then uh, let's say Sonoma has issues. We're not partnering with Sonoma though Partnerships are always good things. The, the obvious answer there is something emergency, and that would be containerized D cells. So if it's going to take secret seven years to do this, should one of the options be to perhaps go through the CEQA process so that if we do need this in, in, a, in a severe emergency, we put the pieces in place, or at least we've got the process started so that we may be able to move things more quickly in an emergency situation. And, and those are my comments. Did Steph wanna address that or would you? Yeah, I think they're great comments, uh, Mr. Minikis, I, I, I do. And it, it's interesting and we have talked about what Sonoma's benefits might be out of partnership with Marin. Um, of course, when you when you look at that system, there are reservoirs at the top end of the system, you know, Mendocino and, and Lake Sonoma, and of course at the bottom of the system. If you think of us, you know, in, in the south, there are, we have a reservoir system, and we're we're all interconnected. So, is there some maybe mutual emergency benefit that Marin Water could provide to some of the the customers in Sonoma? You know, in an emergency scenario. Um, could Sonoma store water in an in, in emergency, uh, in uh, drought conditions in, in our reservoirs, which you would expect to have capacity at that time? So there are some potential um, avenues for us to explore where, where Sonoma would see some benefit, uh, not to mention, of course, investing um, in their, their system. Yeah, Paul, I, I just wanted to build on that and note um, the, the issue of an emergency, whether it's a scenario that Mr. Minnick has laid out or the time before um, the, a water supply project can be, can, can be completed um, has been on our minds. And we do expect as we bring these options to develop the roadmap, that's gonna be a consideration of um, if the roadmap ends up being, you know, a project that we're projecting could take eight years, we have to have a plan and we will talk about what would we do in the interim if we were in a severe drought before this project was realized. So it's part of what we're thinking and we'll kind of roll out and be part of the discussion as we're developing the roadmap, looking at the options. Great, I appreciate that. And, and with that, there'll be another consideration that I meant to add, either with water coming from the inner tie or ground, groundwater banking is, are there taste considerations? Will, will rate payers, will customers notice a difference of any sort? Just, just something for consideration. I'm not looking for a comment though, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Phil Sauter, then Clayton Smith, please. Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd like to uh, echo and, and piggyback on some of the comments, particularly Rogers and, and Larry's and, and what Paul just said as well. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's, it's kind of my first time through this in a public meeting and it made sense and it, I tracked it from beginning to end and it was really helpful. Um, I wanted to focus on the storage issue uh, with regard to Sonoma. If, if I've done my numbers right, it looks like they have about a six year supply of uh, storage in, in their uh, currently a little bit less than six years. And it also looks like on a per capita basis, they have 
almost twice as much storage as, as we do in Marin. And I'm wondering if, if Sonoma storage is really an option. And, and I think people are kind of circling around this and it, it's starting to make some sense to me. Is there a way that we could um, cooperate with Sonoma and actually have some Marin storage uh, be part of Sonoma storage? or perhaps even put in some capital to allow Sonoma to create more storage, a portion of which would be dedicated to Marin. So not only could we purchase water from them, but they would store it for us until we need it so we don't have to worry about spilling over. Um, I did hear the, the, uh, the, the groundwater bank seemed to have some problems. So if we could find a way to, to not only purchase water from Sonoma, but to get their help with some financial investment and having them store it for us, it might be a solution that's pretty close to home. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Sauter. I, I'll just give you a bit of my perspective on that. I think um, much of the integration that we're exploring as part of these Marin Sonoma partnerships is essentially how do we effectively use Marin store or Sonoma storage and Marin storage in the most efficient manner and how do we optimize the use of it so even without dedicating storage for Marin could there be uh, an operational policy that essentially manages manages that a Marin block of water in Lake Sonoma to the most uh, efficient operation so I think what we're trying to do is explore some of that through either the take of the winter water or, or, or taking of water during different trigger times, whether it's storage or drought triggers, so that we're moving water in the ideal times to reduce the risk of, of drought shortages. So we are, we are exploring that kind of operational piece. Um, and I think your comment on kind of dedicating an allocated proportion um, is a good comment. Uh, Mr. Clayton Smith, please. Okay. Um, my sense of the paucity, from the paucity of public attention to this issue, leads me to ask uh, how many people are attending online today, and how many people have been online at each of your previous meetings and workshops. I know that Zoom collects uh, that information, and it can be displayed in real time. Uh, uh, during your presentations, if you choose to have it there. Uh, I also wonder, when are you going to hold an in-person meeting so those of us who have been interested in this issue can actually have the chance for some genuine exchange uh, over all of these points that are being brought up, which are all rather complex, and they should be basically dealt with piece by piece as the meeting is going along. Um, most of the numbers you present are difficult to apply in, in, to the uh, general problem in a practic practical uh, and understandable manner. I think this could be fleshed out in a real community dialogue. And an example of this is in the d -cell presentation. Like, what are these um, uh, amounts of uh, uh, relative to the current anticipation, anticipated demand and how much of the demand actually could be met by D cell and actually what would the cost of it be to the uh, average consumer on a per capita basis? That would make this uh, something that would be of practical uh, understanding and significance to the people. Uh, and it's not addressed at all. Those numbers are not vetted down in that kind of distilled manner. Um, questions concerning demand management always avoid the topic of population growth uh, driven by the recent housing edicts from ABAG and the state's legislation compelling an 8% uh, increase in Marin's and other Bay Area counties populations in the next decade. And I wonder when these uh, concerns are going to actually be brought up and dealt with here. And I also think it's a very small price to pay to top off our water tank in the wet years from Sonoma, whatever 
that might uh, add to the uh, expense um, uh, for all of these future emergencies. Uh, to me, that's a completely no brainer issue. I can't imagine that that, that hasn't been dealt with uh, routinely in the past. Uh, we should be mindful of the fact from an economic point of view that our home equity could rapidly evap evaporate uh, should our county run dry. And so with all the people talking about reservoir building and digging, I've been talking about this for uh, uh, to the previous board many years ago. This has been something people have been asking for. And I think it's a bullet that you, uh, it's time to stop dodging. It's time to bite that bullet and start looking for some opportunities so you can bring that water from Sonoma that everyone's talking about and put it someplace here in the county so it's readily available for us uh, and 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 have it have it here uh, and and I don't think that um, given the fact that they actually have overages up there that it would be a difficult supply uh, if we if if we have the money we should get it done um, so that's my thoughts. Great, thank you for that, Mr. Smith. Thanks, Mr. Smith. The next uh, speaker, Yolanda Gibson, Christy Denton Cohen, and then Steve Isaacs. Okay, I think that, am I unmuted here? This is yes. Jeff. Yeah. Oh. I'm Yolanda Gibson. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but my wife was the last user of our Zoom, so I apologize for that. It's me, Jack Gibson. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, in any event, I just wanted to pick up on uh, something that a speaker actually a speaker said earlier on, and it's been played on throughout the last part of the conversation here. Uh, and that is, I've been totally uh, obsessed with the possibility of a non-creek reservoir. Uh, and Paul mentioned he doesn't think that there's any uh, uh, area appropriate for it in our area. I commented to the same on the same point to Ben a couple of days ago, and he said exactly the same thing, uh, that there seems to be no physical location remaining for a non-creek reservoir. I, I, I can't begin to challenge that. I think it's worth a, a closer look, however. But more importantly, what I wanted to say here on this point is uh, we're, we've got to think outside the boundaries. What we're looking for here, among other things, and most importantly, is storage. Uh, the non-creek reservoir that we would jointly store water for Sonoma, potentially North Marin and us, uh, wouldn't even have to be on our reservoir. It could be in North Marin territory. It could be in Southern Sonoma somewhere. Uh, the location doesn't really matter. It's, it's storage and it would be regional storage you know, for the entire group. If we can put it on our property, great. Uh, but it, that's, not a, that's not absolutely necessary. That could be placed wherever it physically could be placed, but it would be to the benefit of all of the regional water districts and everybody, including West Marin, you know. Okay, that's, uh, I don't really need a comment on it. I just wanted to get that thought out there. Thank you. Um, Christy Denton Cohen, please. Hi, everyone. Um, I, th I think I get more confused the more meetings of these that I attend. Um, and what I would like to see as a, as a request is that when, as you go forward, perhaps some of these options, these different ideas that could come up with our, the solutions that we need could be presented in tandem. If we store water here and we recycle water, um, this is what we would get. Because every time I hear, and I think you know, increasing storage is great, but if we're in a drought, Sonoma's in a drought, if our water storage is down, we're not getting rain either. So that isn't a perfect solution. And I don't think any of these solutions are perfect. But I think if we could be educated on how we could make these different ideas work together um, so that as we probably are looking at another year of drought, if La Nina comes through, um, if there is a major wildfire in the watershed, we can still have backup somewhere else and whether that's through recycling or desal. I just would like some, not tonight, I don't expect it tonight, but going forward. Also, I think a couple of the other speakers have mentioned this. We can look at 
cost per acre foot to a blue in the face, but it's not going to tell me what my water bill is going to be. And I think if as you get further into this, if you could give us an idea how much this solution would raise your water bill, how much that solution or this portfolio would, um, that would be very helpful. It almost sometimes seems like, well, if we don't come up with something now, what are we going to do if there's no solution? And we just kind of go with the status quo. Um, my final comment would be, it seems like we're getting very close to the elections in November, and it seems like we're not going to have a final report by then, or if we do, it's going to be coming out so late, it's going to be very hard to have any of the candidates debate the issues. So basically, I understand that there's real no, really no answers that you can give me here, but these are just thoughts of concern. Um, I, I just will briefly weigh in on um, what you were suggesting that maybe there's a combination. I, I think it's not unlikely when we talk, talk about developing a roadmap that there'll be multiple paths we'll want to pursue, at least to the next level of kind of pre-design and understand it better. But at the heart of it, your comment kind of is diversification, and that is a key criteria in terms of reliability as we start looking at these options in tandem and, you know, all on one page. We're, we're still now, as you noted, you know, at the effort of refining these alternatives. But I think we're going to get to where you're looking for in terms of how do we put together a roadmap and it's likely certainly conservation is going to be there as well as, you know, I, I, I don't want to predict, of course, um, but I, I'd be surprised that X is the answer, certainly at this point. I, I do not imagine that's what the roadmap is going to be. It's going to have branches. It's going to account for if you're pursuing one option that for some reason ultimately doesn't happen, you don't want to be left you know, going to, uh, you know, the start of this whole process again. So um, I, I'd say on that, bear with us and continue to attend. And as we move into September, October, I think you'll see the richer discussion when we're really putting this all together, including, and we've heard it before, and we will capture the impact of these different, when we lay this out in a summary way, to develop the roadmap, the impact on the rates. I would appreciate that. And those are good comments, Ben. I think uh, I think that there's so much fear around some of these solutions. Like I'm gonna get cancer if we have recycled water or the fish are gonna be killed if we have desalination. That I think if there's a way to present this, there's just so many negatives coming out of those two solutions in particular, that if there's a way to educate all of us to kind of move beyond that and see where the other opportunities are, that would really help the public. Thank you, guys. And uh, Steve Isaacs. Uh, good evening, and thanks, everybody. Uh, good job. Very informative. Uh, I'd like to follow up uh, just now on, uh, uh, on Christie's comment about the report. Um, we heard initially, I think, that the report was going to be done in June, maybe July. Uh, when is it going to be done? Uh, what is the date, uh, please? Second. Um, well, well let, let, let me just jump on that if I could, Steve. Does sure. that work? Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm not comfortable and I'm jumping in for anyone to throw out a date. Um, we, we were um, ambitious overly, and that's on me for early on throwing out July. Um, as you see, this is complicated, and the primary objective is to get it right um, as best we can and to take the time necessary to do that. Um, I believe Paul showed, you know, September, October is a time frame we hope we're starting to get to you know, the criteria and starting to move towards the selection of the roadmap. Um, I, I feel that's likely to bleed over in November, um, and, but that's kind of a best case. I, I'm confident by the end of the year, we'll have a roadmap, um, but I, I wouldn't want to pin it earlier because, you know, it is, it, 
everyone appreciates it's so important to um, have these sorts of conversations. There was an interesting comment of, should we do one in person in some large room where we, and what we don't want to take shortcuts of getting, not, not shortcuts, but um, it's just public engagement and discussion, for example. You know, we want to keep having these public workshops until we've answered all the questions that are out there. And the further we go, there's probably going to be more questions. So I, I understand and appreciate the question. I would say um, for a typical project like this, we've been moving very, very fast. Um, the Jacobs team and staff, and we're going to continue to move as quick as we can, but we just cannot, as I think you can appreciate, compromise the quality and the robustness and the level of engagement, all of those in terms of um, rolling this out and completing it. Well, I have to, uh, I have to say that I'm terribly, terribly disappointed in that answer. Um, the public has been uh, told by, uh, by the board and by management that we would be seeing a report sometime this summer. That's fine. Uh, we have an election with, th with two now uh, board of directors coming up for re-election. And uh, as a previous caller mentioned, the report is a perfect opportunity uh, for the candidates to express their opinions on their views on what we should be doing and when, uh, with the report coming out as late as you're proposing, that is just not going to happen. Now, I, I understand. So that's just a comment. I'm not looking for, for a response, but uh, I think I, I, I express the point of view from many, many people that that is a very, very disappointing uh, answer. Um, another comment. Um, Earlier, someone asked uh, what we could do uh, in terms of, I think it was Mr. Meineke, about the desal process, uh, the um, uh, uh, containerized desal process. Uh, there was no answer to that question. Uh, could we uh, get an answer to how you feel about going forward uh, with uh, looking at that uh, and, um, uh, trying to do something in advance of the emergency, uh, of any emergency. And thirdly, um, the cost uh, and the dollars uh, that you've proposed uh, are important, obviously, very, very important. But there's also the cost of doing nothing, just conservation, which there are many people, that's what they feel we should be doing. And it would be very, very helpful if the report indicated and quantified what the cost of doing nothing would be uh, to the county. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanna share that I, I have not heard um, from, for example, for many of our board that um, we should just be doing conservation. I, I've heard that conservation needs to remain a key element of what we do. We should be thinking of conservation as an element of water supply, which is what we're doing. We're going to do a deep dive in conservation Tuesday night in terms of how conservation fits in with a lot of specificity because there's a lot of interest in that piece. And we're going to share the analysis and the numbers um, for that. Um, I, you know, I, I would just say... Um, uh, on your other comment that um, that in, in my role, the, the fact there's an election coming up is completely immaterial to this project and it's gonna remain so. We're gonna do the work we need to do to deliver to the board and public the best information we can to develop a roadmap, working as hard and as fast, but not compromising the quality. Ben, I would just add to the, the question on the containerized desal. I think, Jim, you did go through that and suggest that right, this could be an option where we went through and built the infrastructure and obtained the permitting ahead of time in preparation for deploying 
um, either leased or purchased, depending on what, what made sense at the time, um, containerized desalination units. So yes, I, th I think that is, uh, th that's the intent of that option. And Paul, what we have, because it came up before the time it takes for an EIR, uh, we have an EIR for desal that we would build on, right? So it wouldn't yeah. take the typical amount of time that an EIR like that would take. That's right. No, but, <clears throat> but the rest of the permitting process still will take some time beyond. Absolutely. Yeah. We have two more speakers, uh, Larry Minikis and James Krajewski. Go ahead, Mr. Minikis. Yeah, I, I wanted to come back on for a moment. Thank you. Um, to Mr. Isaac's comment, I, I want to uh, go back to a comment I made um, several meetings ago that I was the one strongly suggesting for the public's benefit to slow the process down and not try to hit a timeline. Because as we're going deeper into this, it's a spider web. We're learning more and more and more, and we're uncovering more, and we're getting surprises, and we're 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 fine tuning this work, and to rush it because of a political process is just the worst way to run a municipality that I could possibly think of. I would never want the political process to be part of the long term decision making process of of this district, and uh, I I just felt that I needed to say that that it's really important we get it right. I don't think. Aiming at the end of the year should even be the goal here. I think getting the process right, getting to a place where the public understands, well, it's gonna be difficult. The public needs to really follow this to understand the intricacies of it. But for the directors and those of us that are following closely to come to a conclusion where we feel this, this is the best we can do with a limited set of options with everyone having issues with it. There is no perfect solution to any of this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. James Kojewski, please. Hi, uh, thank you. I uh, agree very much with the last speaker about getting the process right. I don't think this should be rushed because of an election. Uh, there are plenty of questions you can ask the current uh, directors or direct directors running uh, at the moment as to why we are where we are uh, without rushing through this process. So it, the process needs to be uh, done, uh, taking the time that uh, is needed so that it is a reliable and thorough process. Um, secondly, I, some comments have been made suggesting about in-person meetings. Uh, I am not in favor particularly of in-person meetings because I think these Zoom meetings give people an opportunity uh, to all attend and they can be more frequent and anybody can participate from anywhere. So I'm much more in favor of Zoom meetings. And third uh, point is the discussion of conservation. Uh, I think that all the discussions of conservation need to look at what the costs of conservation are. Conservation is not, does not come without costs, just like all of these other alternatives. So rather than just saying, well, we can conserve and do this, let's not pretend that it doesn't cost us. And so what I'm suggesting is that in the planning, conservation should have costs built into it as to what that's going to cost uh, our consumers in Marin also. And I thank you for a good presentation tonight and great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have again uh, speakers, the same ones from earlier, Clayton Smith, Steve Isaacs, and Phil Sauter. Go ahead, Mr. Smith. Regarding that comment about in-person meetings, uh, Zoom uh, also permits you to have your meetings to be hybrid. And if you set up your facility, you can have hybrid meetings so people can participate in person and they can uh, do a virtual participation. I think uh, what the uh, individual who is talking about uh, the politicization of this well, it is a political matter, uh, and it's uh, it, it's a, it's a politic a politically um, elected board, 
and it's a political uh, monopoly, a created monopoly, uh, the water district. So it is inevitably and importantly a political situation you are in. But nonetheless, as I've gotten into this uh, and seen how actually complex all this stuff is, I keep on wondering in my mind why this didn't uh, get started a long, long time ago. What were the other people doing years and years ago when this, this issue has been around uh, for, since I've been here for 50 years? And this issue has been plaguing us ever since I went through the drought. We've been going through this stuff. And it's, I don't know what it's, it's taken all this time to get this to come forward. So yes, let's take the time to get it right. The other thing I'm really shocked at, a bit of information tonight, is that Sonoma would have a six year supply of water and we have barely two. Wow, what does that say? I mean, that says so much. And it's time for us to catch up with Sonoma and start really being serious, looking at all those scenarios and knowing what Lynn Ingram put in her book, The West Without Water. This is something we should be having a good four or five years of reserves. We should be matching Sonoma and not um, uh, relying and hoping and praying uh, on, on, on all these strange technologies that uh, are extraordinarily expensive. And by the way, how in our supply chain nightmare world we live in, where are the filters for the plants for desal and reclamation? Where are they manufactured? And um, what could the possible increase in uh, the variable costs of those technologies be going forward? Anyways, that's my thought on it. Thanks. I would just, Ben, just quickly comment that I don't believe Sonoma have a six-year supply. Um, Armin, I, I don't know if you've run any numbers on storage, but the, the six, you know, the drinking water demand on Lake Sonoma appears to be somewhere on the region of 50,000 acre feet per year, varies, but there's also a significant release component from Sonoma. Um, do, do you know what the numbers are? I don't have them on top of my head, but it's certainly not six years. Uh, yeah, I, I think I recall talking to the director of operations up there at one point, and she mentioned that maybe it was closer to three years, but we'll, we'll track down that information. I, I also just wanted to speak to the point, and it does come up periodically, of why are we doing this now, not X years ago? I, I want to be clear, what we're doing is largely updating work that we've been doing you know, for decades, which is what's allowing us to move so quick. And reminding folks, in the 80s, we did a lot in terms of response to that drought, raising a reservoir, building a new one. And this is where we find ourselves now needing to respond to climate change driven, uh, predicted changes, of course, to rainfall and heat. And we've been talking a lot about that. So we like almost every water agency in the arid west is we're responding to the changes that I think we all know are happening far quicker and more intense and it's been predicted. And I can talk about Hoover Dam and Lake Shasta and everything else. But I just wanted to be clear that this is not a one-off. This is a continuum of us preparing and looking for ways to increase our security. And this really is in a way kind of a summary. There are some new concepts that we're digging more into that haven't been looked at as much because of new technology or new ideas. But generally, we're able to move in the speed we are in this project because we're using the 2040 and updating those, as Armin said, and yeah. a lot of other previous data and previous work. Yeah, I think, Ben, just adding color to that comment, if you look at it decade by decade, there almost hasn't been a decade in which the district hasn't taken some action regarding water supply starting in the 70s with the original contracts with Sonoma and the early 80s recycled water development of a treatment plant, expansion of that treatment plant in the 90s, 
consolidation and expansion of the contracts with, with Sonoma County Water Agency in the mid 90s. And then again, in 2005, we made further investments in that. And most recently in about 2015, 2017, 18 timeframe, the district made a significant investment with our Las Galinas Sanitation District partnership to ensure the continuation and availability of recycled water in Marin. So, and most recently, the Castagna pump up upgrade as well. Uh, another example, yeah. So I, 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 it, it's a really good point that you made. Okay, the three speakers left are Steve Isaacs, Bill Sauter, and Ed Jamison. Go ahead, Mr. Isaacs. Thank you. Uh, so I'm back. Um, I wanted to respond to uh, uh, Mr. Horenstein's comments about conservation, if I could. Uh, I, I'm not and never meant to imply that the board was only in favor of conservation. There, but there is a significant population in the county that is uh, conservation only. And um, if we take that approach, or if uh, that is the approach that, that the public says we must take, then there is a significant cost uh, associated with that. Uh, that's all I, uh, I wanted to say on that. One other thing. Um, we don't have um, a two-year supply of water. Uh, based on the numbers I've seen, we have a little over a year, um, which is appalling. So the work that's been done over the decades has got us to a point where we have just over a year's worth of supply. Um, and I'm sorry, um, the, the district can't be patting itself on the back over that number. Well, that that's just incorrect, Mr. Isaacs. I, well, I don't know what else to say about that. The, the, the operational storage, right, which is 55,000 acre feet, which if you have drinking water demands of approximately 25, you have two years of storage. If you want to add in environmental releases and the total reservoir storage, it's about 40,000 per year. That's a two-year water supply anyway. Well, Paul, you, you, well, you, you so, also I, need to add to the supply Right. The supplemental supply from Sonoma, as well as our recycling program. Um, right. So, yeah, it, it's more than a year. It, I, if I may, I'd like to respond to that. Yeah, um, of course. It's, I think there is 25 to 30,000 acre feet that are unusable. Um, so that has to be taken out of that calculation. Uh, the balance, therefore, is a little over a year's worth of supply. Uh, yeah, we could no, go. go. It, it's important discussion. The unusable is 10,000 acre feet and less. We've established as part of this project to build in a level of conservatism because instead of a four year drought, it could be a five year drought that we don't want to go below 30,000 acre feet. But it's not saying that water is not available. So 10,000 acre feet is a conservative number that that water's questionable. It's probably more like five, but we wanna be conservative. We've never operated below 10. So 10 is a good number, but that's a number of what's not available. Well, thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Mr. Phil Sauter, please, and then Ed Jamison. Uh, yeah, just using the numbers off of uh, Sonoma's uh, web page, they've got, I think, about 329,000 acre feet of storage. Um, and if I, I think their use is about 50 million gallons a day. So that's where the 5.9 year supply comes from. But that's less environmental releases. So um, they could actually have less than that. I think their per capita storage is about 235,000 gallons per customer. Marin's about 140. So the point of that whole thing was Sonoma's is, is richer in storage than Marin is. And that's the point of looking to see if we could share some of that storage. Uh, point number two is I'm really happy that this process has uh, expanded a little bit. And um, over the few months that, that I've been involved, I think conservation has become baked in which I am really happy to see. I think everyone's talking about it, not exclusively. It's just one of many things that we do. I'm really looking forward to the deep dive on Tuesday. 
And number three is an old marketing hack. I can tell you, you don't change consumer behavior without investing dollars. So yes, conservation is gonna have a budget associated with it. It's gonna be a bigger budget than we've got now. So those numbers will be useful, but I don't see how you can avoid conservation and I don't see how you can avoid spending money for it. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Ed Jamison. Hi, thanks. Uh, just very briefly, uh, three or four months ago, Sonoma's reservoirs were like 54% full. Ours were at 93 or two, something like that, because they did not get the extraordinary rainfall we did. But all, overwhelmingly, our drought will be their drought. And uh, I just don't think people can be looking to Sonoma's vast reservoirs as something that will bail us out of our droughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jameson. I have no further speakers. Well, um, if there's no more speakers, I don't know, Paul, if you had to wrap up, I, I just wanted to thank the participants. I think this was a good discussion. This is our, our hope and desire in these public workshops to engage folks. Um, and it's an ongoing dialogue. And as you heard in terms of the projected completion, we're gonna have uh, many, many more in um, having uh, our customers, having the community understand the complexities of these options, the costs, and help weigh in is part of the essential decision making that our board has asked for. So we're going to continue these workshops and appreciate. I know your time is valuable, but I want to say on our end, we benefit from these comments because it does help us clarify where there's questions, where there's issues, where we need to look further and certain. So um, all the comments, what we take everything down, we review it, we think about it, and we try and adapt for um, going forward. So just wanted to thank everyone for your time and participation and the good questions and comments. Okay. Thanks for that, Ben. Um, I guess we're done for the evening. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate all the participation. Good night. Thank you.